All right, here we go, everybody. Hi, and welcome to Odd Salon. Everybody have a drink? Yes, you're all sitting down, mostly. All right. My name is Tamar Baskine, and I am curating tonight's evening. Our t theme for tonight is Rebel. And behind me, you can see um, rebellious penguins. <laughs> nope. Okay. First issue of the day. Oh, okay. We're good. So, um, I don't know why this is here. We're jumping to the membership. I'm going to go back. What, what did she do to the order of the slides? Anyway, welcome to Odd Salon. Um, you hear six talks tonight, 10 minutes each. Tonight's theme is, is Rebel. And when I first started thinking about this theme, my mind immediately went to, to the well-beloved pop cultural rebels like James Dean and Rebel Without a Cause and Marlon Brando, who in The Wild Ones, when he was asked, his character was asked, what are you rebelling against? He said, what do you got? And then there's Groucho Marx, who's just against it. Rebel, rebel, of course. And this rebel, of course. And then I started thinking, why is it that we like the rebels so much? Is it because we want to be like them? Do we admire them? And, and what is it that, that we admire? Are we drawn to the dangerous? <laughs> or the underdog, David and Goliath here? Or is it doing something that you're not supposed to be doing but you know is right, like Judith, sneaking out of her besieged town against the wishes of the elders and beheading Holofernes in his own bed with his own sword? Because that's a pretty big fuck you. And does it need to include a fuck you? That was the question that I came to. Does the act of rebellion include the middle finger? And if so, who, who are we rebelling against? And, and why are we rebelling? Why are we flipping the bird? And so for my invocation tonight, I want to tell you about a girl, Emma Goldman. <laughs> Yay, you guys know her. Ah, this is awesome. Emma Goldman was born in June of 1869. And uh, she lived uh, until 1940. She was born in Kovno, which was at the Russian Air Empire, what is today modern-day Lithuania, to a, a devout Jewish family. Here's her family. Being a daughter in a devout Jewish family in the 1870s in the Russian Empire meant that her parents had pretty straightforward plans for her. Her father reportedly said, all a Jewish daughter needs to know is how to prepare gefilte fish, cut noodles fine, and give a man plenty of babies. That did not go well. He tried to arrange a marriage for her when she was 15. She refused. <laughs> she said no, and that was her first rebellion that I was able to find. She might have been a rebellious child, but that's not the point here. So she also rebelled against his injection that, that girls don't need an education. Um, she self-educated herself by reading voraciously. She found nihilism and anarchism particularly interesting, and that set her on her path. In 1885, three, there you go. <laughs> So for you guys who are new here, um, we encourage callbacks. We want you to participate. We want you to keep your phones out and tweet and Instagram and take, I'll do all that. And we want you to call back. And one of our regular callbacks is, is ships. Yeah. Thank you. Vessel. Vessel. <laughs> and rebel ships as well. So. In 1885, after three years of, of recurring arguments with her father, Emma was able to emigrate to the US with her sister, Lena. They took a ship, they went to New York, they settled in Rochester, where Emma started working as a seamstress. 
At her new job, she met a guy. They had a world with romance. They married. She said, I do. Then she said, actually, I don't. They divorced about a year later. <laughs> then at, her, uh, at pressure from her family, they remarried. <laughs> Three months later, nah. <laughs> really not. All of this within uh, about a year and a half. Marriage, divorce, marriage, divorce. There are many reasons for this, which I don't have time to go into. If you check out the Something Weird group after the show, I'll be posting a bunch of more uh, information and tidbits up there. After she left her husband for the second time, her parents refused to let her back into their home. And as a, a now a divorced young woman, she, that was the plan, right? The expectation was that she would move back into mom and dad's house. Dad called her a loose woman and refused to let her in. She was married. So she picked up her sewing machine and a handful of dollars, and she left Rochester and went back to New York. So the sewing machine, apparently, it's a tool for rebels. In New York, she started going to a place that was sort of a hangout for the radicals and the rebels. It was called Saks Cafe. And there she met a man named Alexander Berkman, who became her lover and her partner for many, many years. He encouraged Emma to speak publicly, to express her opinions to a wider audience. Um, and she became an activist, and soon she started giving speeches at protests and rallies and demonstrations and so on. And this is a picture of her um, uh, giving a speech in, uh, in Union Square. In 1893, she was arrested. <laughs> she was charged with incitement of riot. Um, that was the charge, inciting of riot. Um, this was one of several arrests that she would face over the years for her rebellious acts and, and words. And when the prosecutor of this uh, incitement to riot uh, trial, when he offered to drop the charges if she <laughs> gave him the names of her, of her people, of her, the other you know, rioters or pre uh, protesters, she threw a glass of water in his face in the courtroom. She was sentenced to a year in the penitentiary. So apparently a glass of water is also a tool for the rebel. <laughs> Her next round of trouble occurred in 1901 when, I'm going to try to say this name right, Leon Zolgoz. Is there any Polish speakers in the house? Please correct me. No. An American-born Polish anarchist. He was the man who assassinated President McKinley. We don't know this, I'm surprised. In his testimony, the assassin called Emma Goldman his inspiration. He said he got his inspiration at one of her rallies and took it to heart and so on, and she was arrested. <laughs> because now she's a co-conspirator co to an assassination. But she was released after two weeks of detention. There was no evidence linking her to the assassination plot. The assassin uh, was ex executed. And after this happened, Goldman and Berkman kind of retired from, from public life and protest. They, they took this really hard. Um, and she worked as a nurse. But in 1903, so two years later, she came out of retirement <laughs> when Congress passed the Anarchist Exclusion Act. And that did not sit well with Emma, no. She went back to public rebellion, speaking out against the corruption of, of the government. And in 1906, she began publishing a journal. It was called Mother Earth, which gave her a wider platform um, for anarchism and socialism and women's rights and free love and all kinds of things that other people did not really want her to talk about. When the U.S. entered uh, World War I, Emma declared her opposition to the war and the, the uh, conscription, the mandatory conscription that was facing U.S. men at the time. And so, in 1917, she was arrested again. <laughs> this time, after a raid in her office, the office that she shared with Berkman, uh, was raided and, quote, a wagon load of anarchist records and propaganda was fined wagon load. She was sentenced to two years in prison 
and a $10,000 fine. And this is 1917, so that's a lot of money. Berkman was sentenced to the same, and both of them also faced the possibility of deportation after their release. The U.S. had had enough, basically. Um, at this point, she was called the high priestess of anarchist. She was called the Red Queen, even though I'm not really sure how that fits in here. Um, the press didn't like her. The U.S. government didn't like her. This is them at the, at the trial, her and uh, Berkman. This is now 1919. They served their two years in prison. They paid their fine. And then they got deported. Where did they go? <laughs> To Russia <laughs> because communism is better than capitalism apparently so in her big rebellion against the US what ended up happening is she went to Russia in Russia with Berkman um, and, a, and a number of other deportees uh, they all went there but her and Berkman started a fact-finding mission they went traveling the countryside to see how well this revolution was working out for the Russian people After this two-year fact-finding mission, she declared that the Bolsheviks were not, in fact, living up to the ideals of the revolution. So Russia took her in. She said, ah, uh, no. Mm -mm. She published her findings and her ideas, rebelling against the people that she looked up to and, and who took her in. Um, she lost support and friends and allies, and she had to leave. <laughs> she didn't get officially deported, but she was encouraged to, to go. She went to Berlin and worked there for a while, and then Berkman stayed in Berlin, and Emma went to England. In England, she spoke out against the communist experiment, and she, she ended that alliance. Um, she said, the benefits brought to the Russian people by Bolshevism exist only on paper, painted in glowing colors by Bolshevist propaganda. And that pretty much ended that. But she didn't stop there. She started speaking. Uh, um, she started speaking engagements in England. Excuse me, um, speaking out in favor of anarchism, um, and she almost got deported from England. But she was saved when the Scottish anarchist James Colton offered to marry her for citizenship. <laughs> she said yes this time. <laughs> So she stayed in England. She did not stop rebelling. Her next object was the rising national and fascist uh, forces in Europe. We're in the 1930s at this point, and we all know what happens there. In 1936, she joined the Spanish anarchists. She likes the anarchists. That's the one constant going through all these rebellions. Um, but then she started criticizing them when they joined forces with the Spanish communists. So because she's not a fan of the communists anymore and the anarchists joined forces with them, she started criticizing. Uh, that did not go over well with the Spanish anarchists, and she went back to England. And here she engaged in a double-edged rebellion. On the one hand, she protested the fascist regi regimes excuse me, in Europe. But at the, at the same time, she considered England, quote, more fascist than the fascists. And she was calling the Allies fascists in disguise. <laughs> Can we imagine how well the Allied forces took this? Not so good. So this did not go over well. And in 1939, she left England. She went to Canada. Somewhere in there, she was allowed to come back to the US to give a, um, a, for a, a, um, excuse me, a tour, a speaking tour a, about her book. But she was told to not engage in any political speechifying or propaganda at all. Like, that's not okay. They let her in for 90 days and she had to scoot out of there. <coughs> Excuse me. In Canada, in 1939, this is when the war was starting, she kept writing out against the increasing tensions and the violence in Europe. She died in 1940. This is her headstone. They got the date wrong. <laughs> To her, I guess, I don't know. The US authorities at that point let her body uh, come back in. They allowed it to be buried in Chicago. <coughs> Excuse me. Where a well-known group of anarchists that had died was buried. Um, 
even though the U.S. once considered her, quote, the most dangerous woman in America. Now that she's no longer able to speechify, she can come back in. So she started rebelling as a young child, and she didn't stop. She kept going right up until the end. And I'd like to close this little section with, uh, with Emma Goldman's own, own words, one that explained why, why I like her, and, and also maybe why we like rebels so much. She said, the history of progress is written in the blood of men and women who have dared to espouse an unpopular cause. Thank you. Which brings us back to tonight. Rebels, I'm delighted to introduce our speakers for tonight. We have Barbara North, North and Kyle Weaver and Seth Rosenblatt and Jesse Hansen and Rob Geyer and Annetta Black. And first up, we have Barbara North. Barbara, you ready? Here she comes. <laughs> 